Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Lucid, and I'm joined once again by Sai. Hello. Still here. <laughs> Still here. Yes. For you, what was a couple of days for us was a couple of moments. Yeah, we, yeah, Sai and I are both talkers, right? So we can, we can really go into it on each of these nations. And I, I really love hearing what he has to say and kind of riffing off that. So it's going to be really yeah, hard for us to not go down a ton of rabbit trails, I can already tell. Honestly, I think that's a good thing. I think that, like, as far as, like, you know, player experience goes, us going over, like, lots of different build options yeah. for all these nations is probably going to be a lot of fun for folks to listen to. Yeah, I think so, too. But, counterpoint, we have 16 nations and a lot of turns. Like, may maybe this is going to be a 100-turn game. So we're going to, you know... Oh, sure, we're gonna have, yeah. We gonna be a we element go over that every... We're going to have to control ourselves <laughs> some, but... It's going to yeah, be fun. We, we won't be able to go over every single build for every single turn. Right. But, but you know, for starting out like now, I think yeah. it's fair to talk about like how the different nations play. So there's maybe no better nation to talk about build, different ways that they can play than Micklin. Because Micklin, in some ways, oh, like this box standard things. Oh, but I have Micklin is a kind of on this Micklin build. So this I is... really don't like this Micklin build. Oh, gosh. Build. I haven't seen it. So. It's don't ruin it, bad, for me. man. Okay, it's really bad. <laughs> oh God, you're gonna. Those are fighting words. I know Zan probably had something to do with this. This this team is Toldy, who's the one who qualified, and Zan is his Hydra partner. So you're gonna blame Zan for corrupting Toldy? I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think so. If it's a weird build, it's probably Zan's. It's not a weird build. Like if you were to like look at like you know what is meta? What do people run in general? It just doesn't fit Micklin at all. It's really bad on Micklin in particular. Okay. I mean, Micklin is such a versatile nation, right? Because let's talk about the nation. We'll do the build in a later episode, but... Okay. So the nation... I can give a summary. Yeah, I, I, I'm a huge Micklin yeah. fan Hit person. I was like one of the deepest Micklin players when this game first came out because I had been so invested in this nation in Dominions 4. My very first Dominions 5 videos were about Micklin because that was the nation that I was playing in Blitzes mm -hmm. when this game first came out. So I've tried out very many different Micklin builds. What this team is running is a compromise bless where they're trying to run an imprisoned stats resist build while still not dumping their scales. So what EA and LA Micklin have as an advantage over every other nation in the game is that they can choose how and where they spread their dominion. What that means is that you can choose to keep provinces at exactly zero dominion based on selective blood sacrificing in order to take on your neighbor's scales. So drain, because you can move your mages around in order to choose where they're researching for your lab hubs, is free. It's like, it's one of the nations where scales dumping is incredibly valuable in general, where only certain scales like luck and maybe growth, which are only which or which are high value where that when they hit your capital matter. And certain other scales like order can matter if you specifically want to spam Jaguar Warriors. So like, you know, maybe right. you're, you're running an alternative build where you want to keep your scales up and just spam lots of sacreds because you're taking a particular, typically an incarnate bless that just needs high quantity sacreds in order to function, like, you know, Blood Bond without regeneration. Like, there's, there's certain builds where, like, you actually do want to run Order 3 in order to make your build work. So you've covered a lot of but, things. So let me let me react to a couple of them, because uh, that way we don't have to come all the way back. The scales dumping. So, so in my there, opinion, there's that's some things, way to play. There's some things that, because a lot of people aren't going to understand some of the core mechanics of how Dominion works, right? So... Oh, I can't see that. We can't see the little outlines, but let's pretend like Micklin's Dominion was right here right now. Those, the provinces that have candles get Micklin scales. If Micklin chooses not to blood sacrifice and they have enemy scales in there, let's say the person, their neighbor ran full scales, which Micklin would love, right? And they have all the full scales in there. They don't actually get all the full scale benefits. What it's they basically- They do if they have exactly zero Dominion. Right. That's the point I was going to get to, right? But if the enemy domain is in there, they don't get it. It'll just be like neutral scales for them. But if it's bad scales, then they get a lot of the penalties from it. So the trick is, and this is what Sai is kind of describing, is if you can selectively blood sacrifice, and this actually is trickier to do because the scales are changing every turn. You don't know exactly what it's going to go to. But if you can selectively blood sacrifice to keep 
the enemy scales completely neutral once they've transferred. Because basically, once you get all the candles gone, the scales don't go back to neutral. They just stay whatever they were. So once the enemy good scales dump in there from their dominion, if you can neutral out the candles to zero, you can basically get it as if that were your bless. Like it, like you in theory could be a full scales Micklin, like with perfect scales, if you conquer a scales nation and keep the dominion at perfect zero. Now that's, and, well, that that's hard to do. Particular, well, that in particular is hard. If your scales are bouncing between negative one enemy dominion, positive one your dominion, they're still going to be almost perfect scales. And whenever they're in the enemy's dominion, they're going to be, you know, at, at basically zero. Yeah. And whenever they're going to be in your dominion or at neutral, you're going to get full benefit from those scales. Right. So um, drain three is free because you're basically researching in either whatever your enemy or whatever your, or not enemy, whatever your neighboring nation scales are or at neutral. Like that's right. what you're researching in. Right. Or yours. I mean, because it can shift if you accidentally over bump it up but you can try only to keep you it. keep your dominion up and you can choose like oh i see that my, dimi well, my but dominion it, but it's kind of a thing right because like you could bump it up to three candles by accident because you blood sacrificed or something and it trickled in that will start affecting scales and you'll have to like let the enemy candles back in and so it'll have to be basically like neutral like blank for a while while you let the candles like the scales reset from their dominion then you have to try to wipe it back out to zero if your scales stay in there for too long. Anyway. But it's all very manageable. It's I all think, manageable, but my, my point is like... You can choose exactly how many slaves you're sacrificing in yeah. every fort. My point is it's complicated, right? Like, it's like... It, this is, okay. this is so like new will, player material. This is like I will admit player, that, very sweaty shit you're talking about that I love, by the way. Okay, so, so Micklin might have a skill cap, but by default... I, I genuinely believe that, like, when you're starting an LA or EA Micklin build, you're, the very first thing you should do is dump all of your scales, except maybe luck or growth, depending on how you specifically want to play your nation. Yeah. Like, okay. that should be where you start. I and mean, they did not do this. And then the units that they recruited are also wrong. You expand with Eagle Warriors, not Jaguars. Okay. Well, I don't know what their build is, so we'll, we'll speculate that on when we get to see it. But, oh. Yeah, it's, this, this is great. this is looking ahead. They took they took heavy resists. They took okay stats. Like the stats are yeah. like awful, just not as much as they could have taken. And then they also recruited the wrong units. They recruited jaguars, not eagles. I mean, you can expand it. I've done jaguar expansion. It's fine. I mean, eagles in some yeah. ways are better. Eagles also, though, I will say, they do follow in the Zabalban path of killing the commanders and fucking dying. But and not I, if you use enough slingers. Okay. Yeah. I've seen Mifflin has Mifflin has these extremely low resource slinger units, which are the perfect unit for baiting cavalry to go hit them instead. Yeah. True. Like Mifflin is you use way them on better attack at closest the, or attack rear. So you use the evil warriors and hold attack archers okay. on crossbow provinces, and then or archer provinces. So like anything with ranged units is almost free because your evil warriors will very reliably kill ranged units and commanders. And then that gives enough time for the cavalry to hit your uh, slingers so that they're in melee at the time that they're routing, which means that your units are following them. So they, they never get the chance to, like, go mask your evil warriors with nothing else hitting them. Okay. So, yeah, I've, I, I have seen side play Mecklen. He's got a series up on his channel. It's old. I think it's, it's maybe beginning it's at Dominion very old. Five. Um, it was one of the weird, like, pioneers of Thunder's kidding. weapons, like, eagle warrior thing and made that meta. Go check it out. Well, it's that a cool was when video. Quickness was bugged. That was right. when Quickness was bugged. That's true. There. God, that was so broken. The four, Quickness, for those who don't know, when Dominions first came out, gave you four times the number of attacks, not two. That was... Yeah, it was... It was Everyone was running Quickness. Like, I was playing Quickness Micklin against Quickness Elheim. Right. Or Tia Ternanog did not run Quickness, and they were left behind. Yeah. But, okay, so quick summary of Miklan, we'll move on. In early age, the recruit anywhere one you get is Jaguars, and the Eagles are cap only. That's also how it is in the late age. Middle age is the exception where it reverses it. In middle age, the Jaguars are cap only, and the Eagles are recruit anywhere. So, we're in late age. They also get Rain Warriors, which are really good at jumping in ponds. So, yes. Rain Warriors allow you to rush certain nations. Oh, I should say, just say really, and that's the, that's the one in... LA, if you took an extreme bless, you can rush Rillia and just kill them like you were zero. 
And they also allow you to take a fight to any amphibious nation that didn't take a similarly heavy bless. If they're what you border, like, so if you're fighting over an ocean, you can take Atlantis yeah. in the water with rain warriors. No problem. Yeah. Especially if you have a good bless and then you like through start throwing quickness on those dudes and wave warriors and water ward and shit. These guys can become fucking crazy. So. Yeah. So um, Micklin, Micklin can, doesn't, or blah, Micklin doesn't benefit as much from their underwater provinces as a nation like Erythia or Atlantis. Right. But they can win battles underwater. They can. Yeah. But then it's like, you know, if you, the rain warriors probably aren't your best troop on land. So it's kind of a decision you have to make. So. We'll see what they yeah. do. They're not very close like, to the water system here, which is a little unfortunate. The, the Micklin starts random, so I didn't place them on the map. They spawned randomly here. Yeah, um, I, I played Micklin on a map that had too many water provinces. It was that Japan map. I don't remember what it's oh, called. Oh, I think I've seen it, um, yeah. Yeah, So, but like it, it has too many water provinces. And I killed Atlantis through the water as Micklin because nice. I knew the map had too much water, so I just spat, like I expanded with the Rain Warriors right. and just used those as my mainline troop, and that was the only thing that I built. And the Jade Serpents are also underwater capable. They're Oh, amphibious. okay. Yeah, and I mean, the, the Rain Warriors aren't bad. It's not like you can't expand with them on land. Like, they're probably not as good as Jaguars at expansion, but they have like a little better protection, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. And they also have a longer weapon. And a longer weapon. So, yeah. Yeah, so between those and Jade Serpents, Micklin is an extremely underwater capable nation. Right. Okay, so that's Micklin. Next up, we have Gath. Gath so is being Gath, played by uh, so the, Maven. And yes, his, they his Hydra me, is a Kosama. So they asked me about how to play Drain versus Magic Gath when they were building their Pretender. Ooh. So I actually talked to this person when they were making their build. But I think they got it wrong still. Okay. So it's not a bad build, but the way that... So Gath is a nation of two extremely different flavors where if you play Magic Gath, then you use different units because you don't really get much value out of your Levites and you use your Sibyls for your researchers. So Magic Gath is a flexible... Very normal for LA human nation where you have right. relatively efficient shielded troops, extremely efficient nature astral mages, and that's what you do, right? Like you do, you know, big communion stuff, but their temples are very expensive. So you use relatively fewer blood mages, you use relatively fewer sacreds, and you're a little bit more flexible in terms of like, you know, who you're fighting where because, you know, your lab rats are decent mages. Right. To, for people who aren't familiar with Gath, they get these big gibbers out of their capital. And these are not as good as Anakites, but they're on par. You know, they're in the same, they're playing the same game as Anakites, which are kind of one of the, the era defining sacreds. They're big giant sacreds. They're, they're nowhere near Anakites. Then but yeah. you have the, the Levite Zealot, which is a human sacred, recruit anywhere. And this is special. So... Not a lot of nations in the game get Recruit Anywhere Sacreds. Of all the nations we've looked at, Micklin can... I can't think of anybody else, really, that's, that has Recruit Anywhere Sacreds we've looked at so far. Yeah. So the um, big thing with Gath is that with a, with a magic build, you don't worry about the Levites, really. Right. You might use Givers, you might not. You just use their Asherite soldiers and Gadite swordsmen. Right. And that, well, that's, what, that's your thing. You're a normal human astral scales nation. But this is a Drain Gath, so this is mostly what I guess we should be talking about. Right. So the, the, the reason that Drain Gath works is that the Isaacarite Sages are, they're a, a unit that requires a Where temple, yeah. but not a lab to recruit. They cost 45 gold and they yeah, had cost yeah. one commander point. So you can recruit two of these per turn. Right. They are not affected by Drain or Magic Scales if they don't have a Magic Path. Oh, I didn't know that. So, right. So there's six research in Drain 3. And you recruit two of them per turn, so that's 12 research per turn, but they're not mages. Right. They can't oh, do if, anything. If, the, if somebody comes to fight you and you're like, mobilize the mage core, these guys are like, what? Mages? We just exactly. read they books. Can, <laughs> they are only researchers, and they still need to be in a fort with a lab to research. Right. So the way that Drain Gath works is that compared to Magic Gath, it's very inflexible. You need to know who you're fighting and when, because your mages have to be in position. Right. And you recruit the, the sages for research, and they're, they're actually good, right? Like, I mean, 12 yeah, RP per research, turn yeah. is, is good. 12 RP per turn. Like, that, yeah. that's great. 90 gold. 
and you recruit the Levite zealots, right? Because you have to build temples to build your sages. So oh, right. you yeah. have temples. So you have your, your zealots. So you need to make a build that makes the Levite zealots work. And that means that you need attack, defense, and strength, right? Like yep. you need stats yep. to make these 15 gold human dudes actually killer. And then because you already have to build your expensive temples, because gas temples cost 800 gold, when you build labs, you also make Kohen. So you have blood mages. And then that means that you make Seir. And Seir are very good sacred blood summons. They have, you know, three attacks per unit. Right. So extremely good attack density. Seer with like Aussies. They're, I mean, they're different, but they're really good. They go berserk. They don't fly. They, ha they benefit from the same blesses right. that the Levite zealots benefit from. So you get great stats on these high density berserk sacred demons. So the, this build basically all plays together, right? Like you build temples, you build blood mages, you build sacred troops, right. you make sacred summons. It's a very sacred focused nation. Yeah. The other thing that kind and of then, plays into it is these zealots have a patrol bonus too, which, you know, a lot of times exactly, you're be using your yes. sacreds to, to fight yes, wars. But yes. if you have a breather, they're excellent. I mean, in terms of gold upkeep per patrol point, these guys are top end for recruitable stuff. Exactly. It all plays together. So the guys that you're recruiting in your research hubs are also the people who are patrolling for your blood hunting to go summon your sacred demons. Right. So it, it all clicks. Like, yeah. like Drain Gath works as a cohesive thing, but it is inflexible. Right. Because it, your mages are basically going to be on the battlefield. You're most likely going to be using your Yeti Onai which are, in my opinion, actually very good buff mages. I yep. actually genuinely like these guys. Well, so no, they're <laughs> half most of them. Of them. All right. but yeah, the fire ones are kind of shit, but yeah, the fire ones aren't great, but everyone else is good. So, you know, they're, they're generally good mages, but you're not really going to want to research with them. Right. You're basically just, and then Abba's similar story. Like these are, you know, good mages and they're healers, which is nice. Yeah. And then, of course, your Kohen Gadols are your super combatants and your... I didn't realize these guys yeah. were heretics. That opens up similar kind of scales manipulation that you could do with Miklin. Not as good as Miklin because yeah. it's not as... It's not as quick. Like, Miklin can flip stuff. Like, it can go from, like... Like, you can put five temple checks in a province. Yeah, no, but the nice thing about this is it's reliable, right? Like, once you have... Three of these, I think you probably need like four or five of these guys in a province, and you will forever right. lock it at zero. It's never going to get also a, that candle in it. Yeah, but also 195 gold. I, I haven't done this. I I'm just I'm shooting the. Sh I it it's possible to do. I know, but I yeah, it may not fit it, it, in it, with the overall plan. But yeah, you conquer is, you yeah. conquer an enemy capital. It has really good scales in it. Maybe one of the first things you do is put five of these guys in it or something, and you're going to have perfect scales in that capital the rest of the game. I mean, five of these guys is a thousand gold. You don't generally have five of these guys sitting around. I mean, a thousand gold, but like good scales and a capital can be like, you know, a hundred gold a turn easy. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. And you might not need five, it's, you know, but anyway, it's an idea. Yeah. So, yeah. So the way that Drain Gath works basically is you take a very stat focused bless and then you build into a sacred and sacred demon aligned army. And then you focus your research on that and your research is fine, right? Because your right. your any four dudes are researching great at, you know, 12 RP per turn per fort. But that said, if you are doing this build, you need to invest in that bless. And the Gath player in this game went for a resist bless, which is not bad, right? Like it, it's fine. Right. It just doesn't click with the heavily sacred focused build that you well, kind of the say you're like you're resists doing. the say you're enjoy it for sure the, the but they also love attack yeah no they like that too but i mean honestly if you've got your say you're in melee and they have magic weapons and they're hitting things like they're gonna do okay i think the real thing if you don't have stats that's gonna be tough is the early and mid game before you have a lot of say you you know because your zealots really do need like zealots with all resistances are really not very special <laughs> at all yeah, no, they're just bog standard infantry. They just cost more. They have total right. protection. Right. Sayir without stats are still pretty fucking good, especially if you put bloodlust and a couple other things on them. Yeah, Sayir are generally good. 
Yeah. So when I ran Gath, I was in a very weird game in that I knew a couple of the people that I was playing against, and I knew that it was a very Air Nation focused build. Right. So I took a Rush build in, with the notion that I would take an Air Capital early and then spam Shadim, and nice. actually was able to do that. Nice. Uh, but that, that, that's not normally how you play Gath. Because yeah, <laughs> like awesome. that, 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 that build relied on killing a nation early and then empowering nation, my mm -hmm. mages in air magic, which is not like a normal consideration. Yeah. Um, and Shadim are not sacred, right? No, That's they're not. That's the trade-off, yeah. They're like yeah. really big storm demons is basically what they are. Yeah, they're, they're basically just better storm demons. Mm -hmm. So with Gath, with this particular bless focused build, I would not have run Luck 3 is, is one thing. I would say I would not have run production three because Levit Delts are only 17 resources. You don't need all of that production. I would have run order one, production one, like neutral luck or maybe even misfortune two, and then invest those hundreds of points that they could have saved that they spend on their skills right. in just a much heavier stats bless than what they took. Yeah, it seems like they're trying to kind of do walk the line between magic and bless. Like they're going to have... It's really what it is. It strikes me as like more late game focused and more greedy, right? Like the resistance, the resistances and stuff are going to play out in the late game. The luck and stuff and is going to give three, a lot of yeah. gems, right? Over the and late age, these gems that you get from luck three are a big deal. But even then, if Levite zealots are the troop that you're going for, you don't need production three because yeah, they, they yeah. have a higher rec point cost, right? But. I'm guess I'm just guessing that that's what I'm going to be doing a lot of size guessing what the players oh, were thinking. Yeah. So, yeah, um, this is one of those things that like it's not quite as bad in my opinion as the Arco build, but it's still non-committal. Like they they had this idea of the build that they're running, and they just didn't go far enough into what this build actually does to make it work. Yeah, it's still fine. Like I yeah. think Gath is a really good nation. I just don't think that it's as good as Gath or as this type of Gath can be. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep moving. Let's come up to Utgard. Now, Utgard is being played by... This um, is another really bad compromise build. Yeah, I know Arco didn't like this one. He had all sorts of notes on it. It's really Wait, bad. Who's playing it? Um, oh, it's it's Aaron, right? No, it's playing Agartha. Oh, Agartha. Okay, who's playing it? This is Squeako. Oh, this is Squeako. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. So Squeako, for those of you who don't know, I've played a lot of games with him over the years. He's the only person to be in the tournament finals three times. I was about to say that this man has qualified to the finals every year. He is right. a very good player. He's, I know he's beat Arco and I in a game together. He's, I've beat him a couple times, but his build is really bad. This is another one of those builds that, similar to his Micklin build last year, I think is going to die early. I think this which is strange because so Utgard is so strong early, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. Utgard is one of the best nations in LA. Yeah. I just think that his build is so bad that he's he's basically neutered himself. So it looks like he's probably gone, I think the things that I think he's done right, just guessing at, and I don't think you need to go quite order three to max out Garm production. I think you can go like order one or two yeah, and, so, and do nine Garms a turn. So so here's the thing about Utgard. Utgard has very good non-sacred troops. If you just go scales Utgard, you're going to do fine. It has very good mages. It has very, very good yeah. expansion troops that don't require any bless. So if you just want to play Scales Utgard, if you just want to do communion shenanigans with your Turbocom Scratty Slaves, Utgard is a really good nation for that. Yeah. If you want to go Sacreds, Utgard is also really good at that. Yeah. Because the, the reason that Gam Herdlings are so strong is that they have very low resource yeah. and recruitment point cost, which means that similar to why Vanheim Ashdod is so strong, or, or EA Vanheim, is that you can convert a significant portion of your nation's gold income into your sacreds. Yeah. So if you take a heavy bless, you can put all of that gold that you get early from your expansion into more early game power. Right. So with a big bless Utgard build, you can just snowball off of your very affordable sacreds. Yeah, and it's um, not... It, it, they're, they're kind of gold expensive. Like when you're making not... because no, they're make, very gold expensive. Because they're, they're, they're so resource and recruitment point cheap, you can make nine of these a turn if you go high dominion build. And nine gar garm herdings a turn is so much murder and death and destruction. It's almost unbelievable. If you take a good bless. Right. So the but, way that I see Utgard is it's an either or nation. You either want to go all in on your bless. You dump okay. your scales. Okay. You 
you spam out the gam herds, you you kill multiple nations early game based on the sheer power of your sacreds, and then you bring out all of your cool magic stuff. Yeah. Or you forget your gam herds exist. You just make your really efficient troops. You make your all all your really good mages, and you use the fact that you have this extremely strong sorcery build to make these efficient mid game armies where you can beat people without losing anything and then fight multiple people right because like the big thing about fighting multiple people for many nations is that you have to pay for it right like you either have to you know lose sacreds or spend a bunch of gems or you know what whatever in order to like actually beat each of the people that you're fighting right. whereas sorcery focused builds like utgard or vadeheim for that matter when they win a war they don't take casualties. So you kill someone. Sometimes. It so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. It, it, yes. It depends. But when you do it right, you can fight a bunch of different people at the same time because with each major battle that you fight, if it goes well, you don't lose your expensive mages. Like you win the battle and you didn't lose your units to do it. And yeah, the court is actually capable of this. I, yeah. I, okay. I, I, Yes, and I think it depends. I mean, it depends. Like, if you're fighting Arco and you're like, well, I'm going to take a battle. Not, I mean, like the player, right? Like, I'm going to take a battle and I'm not going to lose anything. I mean, you know, good luck, right? I, okay, uh, yes. Yeah, so, nation, sure. okay, nation agnostic, right? Like, put him on any nation, turn 30. You know, he'll, he'll even if you win the war, he'll cut a pound of flesh out of you. But right. I just think that but like Turbo Skelly nations... Spam you can easily take a battle without losing a single troop. Right. And I think that Utgard is, is one of the best anti-coalition nations where if you snowguard early, either just through, you know, having good scales and getting a bunch of mages out or via, you know, sacred spam, if you crush people with gam herds. In either case, if you're in the situation where you're 1vx right. and you have to fight multiple neighbors at the same time, Utgard is one of my favorite nations to be on when you're in that situation just based on the flexibility of the nation and the fact that when you're doing everything right and you're actually winning battles, you don't take losses. Right. So, so it's a very, very strong nation. It's a very, very good, well scaling nation such that even with a build that, in my opinion, is as crippled as this one is. Oh, gosh. I think that it can still come back into the game and still do okay. But that said, this build is really bad. Okay, I haven't seen it, it yet. Do but anything. I've, it doesn't I know do it has anything. region. That's the only thing I know. That's the only thing it has. Okay, so the the reason that I'm so upset about this is that Wait, I know the beast um, is fire in nature, right? Yeah, he he just took N seven. Wait, Dad, wouldn't you take Ermin Ermin soul if you do that? There are many things wrong with this build, my dude. <laughs> wait, I, wait. Okay, wait. Time out. Okay, so we went and looked it up. Idol of the Beast is an Air One Nature Two pretender, so. You know, it's going to be so a little he's... cheaper than. I mean, if 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 what you want is shock resistance and regen, and this is the cheapest way to get it. Problem is, you don't really have mobility. Like this guy can't magic phase. I don't believe. Can he it? Cannot. Yeah. No. You need uh, you need teleport like astral to do exactly. it for a lot of the things. So yeah, the cladropes cladropes cannot move an immobile pretender. Yeah. So you you lose. You know. Region's kind of nice. The problem is, well, here's the thing. If you're able to make nine Garm Herdings a turn, they expand fine, though with a tiny bit of attrition, with just a party of nine blessed Garms a turn. You don't really need more than that, but they are really fucking squishy <laughs> with yeah, just region. From archers. Right. Now, if, you're, if you have region and you're running into like, I don't know, Agartha or somebody, and they have like, I don't know, some really tanky units, and they're like, we're going to endure you, and they're not going to deal out a ton of damage. Well, your your Garmin's will do okay with regen, right? But if you're fighting into something killy, it's probably not amazing. But and this is one of the things I was telling Arco, because he kind of sent me a, a note about this, was the I think why regen is kind of nice on Garms is a few things. Now, by itself, it's a little tricky, but let me pull it up. The Garm. So they have Berserk 2, 
for that to trigger, they're going to be significantly more killy once that triggers, right? And they're going to have better protection once it triggers. So this natural protection is just going to jump up from six to eight. But they've obviously taken damage. One of the nice things about it is you get hit, you can kind of go back up. The problem is once they're in melee, at, even once they go up to like 13 or 14 protection, once they go berserk, they're still going to be taking a, a, a pretty high amount of damage. So that's where I'm at on Garms, that you need other things on them in order to make them work, especially in late age where everyone is capable of deploying crossbows. Yeah. One of the easiest things is taking like hard skin because that will knock this up from six to 11. And then when berserk triggers, it'll go from 11 to 13. So you'll be operating pretty close to having stone skin cast on them in conjunction yeah, with hard, their... Hard skin works. Yeah. I think there's a lot of good blesses that work with regeneration. Right. Such that you can make Utgard work as an early game sacred powerhouse. I just, I, I don't think that, or and, I would say... And there's reasonably early targets you can get. Like, these guys with the nature gem can cast the wooden warriors reasonably early into the game. And the sacred... The Garms are going to start performing a lot better once they have any... But this is the thing, right? If you go, like, really heavy into a Garm build, kind of hard to get buffs on all of them because they don't pack well. But high mage communities still get wooden warriors on a decent number of them, but... Alt seven, you can wooden warriors on all of them, but right, yeah. Er, early game, I think that you need to either go full scales or go full do full garm, and that these sorts of compromise builds are just worse at both. Like this build is it, like if you're if you are actually just going to be running like literally just for generation, like don't use your garm hams. Just use your um, what you call them? Some spheres. Go to your scarls. I hear you, but you can make more of these. Like, you can still, like, imagine it's turn 12 and you have 100 Garms that have region on them. I mean, that's a scary force. It may not be optimal, but... You're not going to have 100, though, because you're going to bleed them while you're expanding because even Indies can kill these guys. Yeah, you don't lose that much. I've done region-only expansion with them. It's not that bad. You... You know, it's very bad. <laughs> no, no, expansion is. I mean, you can do even if nine garms kill <laughs> kill, especially if you you have a couple reanimation things to trickle in and help, or you mix humans yeah. in. That's the you, real. You need you need those other things. You need the reanimation. You need the humans. You need support. But but uh, even without the it, they, you you take some attrition. You have to be a little careful what provinces you hit. You know, you need to have lance catchers. You really don't want region only garms running into heavy cav by the you know but, blank. But use javelinists. Yeah, they can they can they can take the same provinces that region only garms can take. Yeah. Well, and and Sai so speaking with a little bit of foresight because I think the game's on turn four when we're recording this. He has a little bit of trouble in expansion. But the other thing that we need to point out as we move I've on also, to the next nation. Also, I also love this nation. Right. Like, I, I love Utgard, but I love either of the two extremes. Right. And I think that this build is is just, it's it's trying to use gam herds and regeneration without actually investing into it. And I, like, I if don't, you don't hate it. If you I don't, don't hate it. it. He's got magic three, so he's going to have good research. You have to be careful with the Garms because they are not... Like, gar with this build, the Garms are not blunt I mean, I'll, instruments I'll of power. I'll say this. I don't hate it as much as I hate Micklin's build. Okay. Well, we'll move <laughs> along. I, you know, I've definitely fought, I mean, I think we all, most uh, people are familiar with really heavy Garm blesses, and they are fucking terrifying. So, you know, side what you're saying about really going full buck wild into the Garm. Yeah, it's fucking scary when somebody does it. And they have good scales troops. I think, and maybe Again, this is the inferior option, but I don't think it's a wildly inappropriate option. I think it's... So I love Full Skills Utgard. I think yeah. Full Skills Utgard is an extremely strong nation. I think this sort of like mediocre Garm Herd region only bless is just like, don't run regen, just run full mm -hmm. scales. And you'll get better results. You'll, you'll get all the same amazing mages. You'll get even better skills because you don't need the Awake Pretender. and like you, you, you can still use Garm herds if you want, but like you can put you know something specific and useful on them, like magic weapons. Like, oh, I need a magic weapon troop. Let me recruit my sacreds that I haven't been yeah. recruiting all game. 
to go answer this particular problem. Like you can still use your sacreds without the other, like, focusing the other on thing them. we should probably just mention is one of the things that it does unlock, and I don't think this is a reason to take regen, but it's an ancillary benefit, is you can put shrouds on your scrotty, which you know, but yeah, that elevate that elevates your ability to use your your mages, your, your mages from like, but no, but like got, the, got, it got goes from like twelve. No, but it goes from like twelve to sixteen or something. Yeah, it's like it's not a huge, very it's not small huge. increase. Yeah, in terms of how you do your turbo comes, like it's it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it matters. Matter. It matters very small. It, it matters very I small. I mean, it's amount. it's fundamentally limiting how many mages you can bring to battle because, like, once you start going over that number in a turbo communion, they die reasonably quickly, right? So, you know, if you want to have twenty mages. You have to have a certain amount of regen, or it fucking blows up. So, anyway, but yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, it's, but not, like, it's not going to like fundamentally change how the nation feels having a regen you can put on a shroud on Scrotty in the mid game. But, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it changed. Like, so, the, it, the it other thing we have number? to address is he took cold three and he's next to Vettiheim, and that's fucking scary. And in my opinion, there are only three nations which are allowed to take Cult 3 in late age, and they are Calum, Vettiheim, and Atlantis. And if you're not one of those three nations, and those three nations are in the game and you took Cult 3, you've probably fucked up. <laughs> and that includes Lemuria. Lemuria, I have discovered, should be run Heat 3. I think Lemuria can take anyone. Maybe. Though, so the way the we'll talk about this, uh, so Lemuria can definitely handle... Uh, a baby rush, maybe, but not ro not rolling this game because Lumuri was right. rightfully banned. But Lumuri is very capable of of dealing with with Vady. I'm gonna say maybe, but we'll see. They have like reach stuck options, yeah, and not relevant to this game. We, we shouldn't yeah. go all into it. So Vettiheim, who we have uh, Hurt Cop and Owl playing Vettiheim. And, yeah. Uh, I have never played a game with either of these guys, but they're pretty active in Discord, and normally they're saying really smart shit. So... Did we about this already in the last recording? No. Oh, okay. So, all right, let me say that Kurt Kopp is probably one of the best currently active Dominions players. Nice. He's he's someone who both understands the game very well in terms of like being able to just have a, a decent grasp of what any given nation is going to do on any given turn. And he's also someone that like is going to test his fights while being able to actually have a decent prediction of what his opponent is going to be casting in those fights. Mm -hmm. Which is so he's a very high effort player, right? And so in in Dominion, that general, matters. Like, it matters a yes, lot. Dominion in general, I would say, is is a game that has no twitch factor, right? Like anyone who is like, if you've literally never played Dominions before. You can still win a Dominions game against the best players by just literally testing everything out extensively in order to understand what's going on in the game. And Maybe. again, not, not like you have not actually true. Like in the sense that well, I what you're saying is right, but specifically because the other thing that is gonna feed into like your testing is intuition and game knowledge and understanding how things work. And nobody okay, so in their first game is going to have good intuition, good game knowledge, understand all the mechanics, unless they've let, got let a thousand hours. So let me let me rephrase that. You can learn all the mechanics of Dominions outside of multiplayer. Right. Um, yeah. It's a game where, but you would have uh, to have spent thousands of hours, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's a game where the game gets easier, and you'll know what to test and what to expect if you played it more. But if you just like literally have a mentor channel open, you know, as some people do, hoop, and just like ask people, oh, what should I expect from this nation at this turn or whatever? And like you pay attention and you go like, you know, take the time to figure out what you should be doing and what you should expect right. from every other nation in the game at a given turn, then like that's the entirety of the game knowledge. And everything else is game sense of like, where is everyone else on the map? Okay, first of all, this is not all the game knowledge side. There's so much game knowledge, all the mechanics, how all the spells work, weird subtleties about, like, order of operations for how combat mechanics go. Right, um, but you know, my point was more that yeah. Dominions is not a Twitch-based game. It's not a yeah. game that you're just playing specifically. It's a game that you learn how it works, 
And once you understand how it works, that, that's it. Like, it's strictly knowledge. So Kirchhoff is a player that will put the effort in. Well, okay, to... knowledge and calculation, too. Because that's right. other, yeah. So, so, so like the, chess, the you can know all the rules, but the whole thing about chess is... You know, that AIs are better than people. Yeah. Well, that too, but yeah. Yeah, so, so the thing with Dominions, so the thing that I would say that I'm best at in Dominions is understanding the state of the board. Like, which nations are strong, which nations are weak, what can I expect from other players at a given point, right? Like, what's mm -hmm. the expected power for other nations in the game? Who can I beat when? What spells should I cast to beat them? Right. Kirkop is very good at that. Yep. And he'll put the time in to understand what he should be casting against which other players specifically. Right. Yeah. Which is, by opinion, Dominion skill. Yeah. Compared to Aaron, who's a pure Diplo player, I think that Kurt Cobb, outside of that diplomatic aspect, which I think he's also fine at, like he's a, you know, mm -hmm. he's a decent yeah. like person, talk to humans. Like he's, uh, he's going to win his fights right. from equal or ahead footing. And that's very scary on a player playing Vettiheim. So let's talk about Vettiheim really Which, quickly. Yeah, I was actually going to mention that too, that Vettiheim in particular is actually a nation that plays very well to a player that knows who he should be fighting when because of their extreme stealth capabilities. Vettiheim is a nation where almost all of their units are stealthy and they have multiple different magic phase options. So they can often pick their fights and they can, they have a lot of options just based on the magic versatility of their nation for building counters. So they can build a counter to whoever they need to fight and then go win that fight. And they can choose their battles, both specifically in terms of what particular army they're fighting where, and in terms of what nation they're fighting when, just based on their ability to raid. Yeah. I think kind of compared to some of the other nations in late age, you know, Vettiheim... They don't have amazing path diversity compared to some of the, you know, like to Bogarus or to Jomen, who are going to get like every, every, everything, right? But they get a lot. They get a lot. Basically, they're in all the sorcery things. They got astral death, blood, and nature, and they've got some water thrown in. So then while they may not have the biggest or the best battlefield spells, they may not doom stack the best in the late mid game. They are so fucking efficient. Right. They can do so much with like they have some of the most efficient budget rating squads. We've got in my discord like a little thing where it's like the 19 PD challenge. It's the cheapest. We've got little weird rules for it. What's the cheapest? You can kill 19 PD. Vettiheim has like multiple completely different ways to to like get super high in that list. So they're super efficient at rating. They've got, they can do very different tiers of commitment. They have all sorts of threat vectors. They've got berserkers. They've got these little rim betty. They've got crossbows. They've got Jotun dudes. They've got evocation bait. They've got so many different things they can do. And the point buffing on oh, all their the size one hurts. guys is, oh yeah, and the wolf raiders are good too. The point Both buffing. brothers. Yeah. Yeah. The, the point buffing on the size one dudes is ridiculous they just they're really good and they're really hard to fight into but you know there's things they have to worry about they don't really love like air elemental timings can be a little worrying for them though they do have ways to kind of deal with it they're not going to love masked archer fire like if somebody's rolling up with 400 crossbows and they're not going to die to foul vapors because they have serpent's blessing it can be a little bit of a problem they don't have good air access but they're, I think they're one of the best nations in the game. And they're very I, technical. Depending on when you release this video, I'm a little bit concerned about us pushing people to go gang up on faults. Yeah, so when you so guys like, are watching uh, this, this is what I've told the players in the game. The game will already be on turn 50. So oh, okay. a lot of the initial yeah, but... things. And then after that, as the game starts to proceed, it may get closer to like 30 turns away from the current turn. So. Yeah, the, the folks that I was, the, or the two nations I was worried about is this one, both because I have a huge amount of respect for Kurt Kopp. I think, yeah. he, like I mentioned, I think he's one of the best technical players currently playing, and he's playing, as you said, one of the best nations. Like, right. It's very easy for us to just saying this, be like, oh, obviously this is the threat. And then the other one was Fullock. Like, he's a great late game player, and I pointed out that he's running a very heavily scaling 
build where he wants to get to late game. I'm I'm worried that we're like by saying that we're going to be saying, oh, gang up on these guys. They're yeah, yeah, very yeah. straight. I, I think yeah. I think by He's the time too. by the <laughs> time the videos come out, right, it's going to be turn fifty in the game. The things are going to have happened. If somebody's a good player and they're going to smash people, that's not going to be a mystery to anybody in the game at turn fifty. You know. Yeah. Yep. Very fair. Um, very fair. So. Yeah. And if there's somebody we're like, oh, Vettiheim's really good, but turn 50, he's small because he's gotten stuck in a bad war. They're not going to be like, oh, you know, Cy and Lucid said he was a good player. Let's go kill him. No, they're going to be worried about whoever's like, actually, the game state is, you know, favoring, I think. So. Yep. All right. Yeah, so let's I keep agree. moving. We're, we're almost at an hour again and we got to finish this. So next up, we have Midgard. Midgard is being played by Kosk and his Hydra partner is Mardag. So Kosk is an old timer, right? He's someone like Warpsy, who's a just a very veteran player who's been playing this game for a really long time. Yeah, he was like in the IRC when I first started playing Dominions back in Dominions Four when Shivalo was the newest nation in the game, right? So like he he was a veteran then. So he's a guy who's been playing this game for since forever. I would yeah, say I've, though, I've played with him a bunch too. Yeah, he, so, he, tends, so what, he and I have gotten in several like forever war. He, he's, I think he could work on his Diplo. It's my, so, my so feedback watching his for him. Game, yeah, watching his game so far, here's what I'm going to say. His build is leaning heavily into Einheers in that right. he's taken Order 3 Production 1, which is more order than you need to maximize your sacred production. And, and your capital. I, but these are recruit anywhere, and you probably won't no, run into recruitment. Wait. And it's Midgard is not wreck anywhere sacreds. Oh, I thought you said Einher. Yeah, his build is leaning into Einher because it's order three. No, but the cap, more the cap only are the vans. Yes. The recruit build, anywhere, the Einher. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Is his build is leaning into massing Einher production, not his sacreds. Right. And you're saying oh, he yes. had more order than he needed. And I was saying to the order, yeah, no, no, you needed yes, your cap, but if you want to max production and lower sorry, resource let, places. Let me, okay. Let me, yeah. me re-explain, I guess. Okay. Uh, yeah. So his build is focused on I'm here because he's taken this order three build, right. which let him spend I'm here's as opposed to a build that focuses on his sacreds and Gelderman. Right. Okay. So, so in my opinion, Midgard's biggest strength is that it has very, very easy expansion if you take certain blesses that... Right allow five vans bodyguarding yeah. a van herd to expand. So you build an expansion party literally every turn, uh, and then you just get big. And then the blesses that you need to do that aren't that big. Yeah, like you, you take, do have like um, six defense. And then... Yeah, so like you take defense and strength, basically. That's what you need. Yeah, um, and you don't even need the strength. I mean, I think because... In my qualifier game last year, Nick Knight ran Frostfather with, it was Water 6, Air 6. And it was just yes. six defense. And these guys are just immune to melee at that point. You know, you have to worry about crossbows, so, but. Right. And you were basically, you bodyguard a Van Hurst and you build an offense party every turn and you get big. And then with that big size, you spam you're very, very good, but expensive Galderman. Yeah, like, that's I kind of... These guys. My, Wait, oh, Galderman, that, these guys, yeah. That's my opinion for how Midgard is, is strongest. You get lots of air elemental casters, but also have lots of different, really good options, actually. Yeah. Like, the, the, the various different Galdermen that you can get can do a, yeah. a lot of really good stuff, like yeah. with their earth magic or whatever. I mean, up, and then they can do earth magic, they can do a ton of things. Air elementals... And they're in yeah, the late game, they're very hard to deal with. You can't wipe, like, a, one of the things in late age is you can usually, like, wipe out, you know, like, Flames from the Sky, kill a bunch of mages. You're not Flames from the Sky all. killing Galdermen, right? Because they'll turn into werewolves. They are very difficult, like, to kill Galdermen, and if you're not assassinating them, you just have to fight them in a normal battle. You can't, these guys are uncheesable. Right, so... They're extremely good mages, and then even their Volva are very efficient astral mages. Right. So for her, for specific matchups, so like if you, if Raga's in the game, for example, and uh, you can't just kill their their guys with air elementals because they're running, you know, a larger shock resistance bus or whatever. You recruit a bunch of these Volva. You cast Luck on your high defense, high strength sacreds, and yeah. you you can basically so so basically mid cards are very flexible nation. 
in, in my opinion, can yeah. win any matchup 1v1 early game if you run a good build. But the build that they're running is focused, because of this Order 3 production one, it looks like they want to spam Einheers, which are fine. I, I don't hate Einheers. I actually, I, I think they're, they're amazing. Good. I mean, they're Berserker they're, 5. Five. Yeah, they're very they're very strong units. Yeah, I think they're better in MA than LA because there are fewer crossbows and right. you have dwarf smiths to buff them. These um, guys hate crossbows. They're a twenty five gold unit that has sixteen protection and twelve hit points and no shield. They get pulverized by crossbows. So yeah, so and they're not stealthy, so you can't be like, oh, you don't know where these iron here are coming. I hope your stack of four hundred crossbows are in the right place. It's like, oh, uh, you're going to walk around. Like, it's a it's an unsheathed weapon when you're moving your stack of iron here around. Yeah, the one thing that they do have is sailing. But even then, it's a, it's a little limited, right? Especially where Midgard is on the map. They don't have a huge amount of flexibility from that. Yeah. Uh, so, so in my opinion, this build is suboptimal just because it's focusing on this unit that is counterable. And which your mages don't support quite as well. Like, Elemental work great on their own. Like, Elemental work fine in a vacuum. They're just amazing mages. Yeah. And, and if you're doing the Sacred Focus build with your one turn or with your one expansion party every turn, like, focus, you get a lot of them, right? Because you're, you're big and you can spam these very good expensive mages. With the build that they're running here, I think it's just a little slow. Where they're not going to get yeah. quite as big could be if they had picked a more expansion oriented van bless. And they're kind of focusing on being able to spam out these I'm here once they get to a decent size, which yeah. I don't know if it's going to really carry. So, like, like I mentioned, Kosk is a very experienced player, and Mardag is, is his Hydra partner, is another, you know, very experienced player. Like, these guys know what they're doing. They, they know what on here can do, you know, when they get a lot of them out. Yeah. They, they understand that this is something that can be strong. I'm just not sure that in this environment where people understand how to counter these things and where, in my opinion, getting big fast has a high value because, like, you need to get ahead early in order to have counters to what other people are doing. If it's going to be quite as good as, as this nation can achieve. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, the thing is, is, you know, we were talking about these guys get butchered by crossbows. So do vans, actually. Like, I mean, vans are going to close the distance a lot faster, but, you know, they get pummeled by crossbows in a similar way. I mean, honestly, they're kind of, they're, you know, and then the, the other thing, I think there's a few special considerations for late age. One of them we were talking about, be very fucking careful taking cold three. Did they take cold three? They went so, heat. Heat three. Right? Yeah. It's a cold preference nation. Did they go cold? No, because you don't go cold three unless you're one of those three nations in late age. But that's one of the things. The other thing that I think is like something to always consider for, for late age is wailing winds is way more common in late age than it is in a lot of other eras. And so is blood. And so you get on way more nations, you have the ability to have blood rain and wailing winds. And if you don't have berserkers, you can't play the game, or some kind of like demon 30 morale unit, you can't play the game. So transitioning yeah. into late game, these guys are going to be a lot better in a lot of matchups. So worth pointing yeah. out, but, but I agree with you. It's slower to start for sure. Yeah. And, and like I mentioned, I do, so I don't hate this build the way that I hate Micklin's build or, yeah. you know, some of the other builds that I see as being like these bad compromise builds. I think this build is fine. I just don't think that it's as strong as Midgard can be played. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Pangea. Late Age Pangea oh, is an interesting duck. It is way different than the other Pangeas. Oh, is that Pangea? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's Pangea. No, no, yeah. So, so Pangea, first of all, Warpsy is another very veteran player. He's a guy who's been in the community right. since forever. And this looks like a build that I'd run. So when I played Pangea, I tried a couple different things, but my... But this uh, is scale, so I like that. Yeah, so when I played Pangea, I took an imprisoned Oracle with literally just plus two defense yeah. pulse resistance. Like, it was basically full scales. This guy is running an imprisoned Idol of Sorcery. Okay. Which you can tell if you well, look yeah, at I, I haven't looked at all the messages here. I need to have done a better job with this. I, 
Yeah, I, I, I didn't read his messages because I've only seen turn four. So he might say what he's running. But in terms of, look, if you look at it less, you can tell he's running an, an imprisoned idol of sorcery, yeah. um, which I think is very cool because the idol of sorcery is a soul, a soul drain. Yep. I think that's the spell. Yeah, that's capable spell. caster. Yeah. yeah, which is a very cool anti-army thing where you drop it on something and you just wipe the entire army. Right. It uh, doesn't kill things even... super fast, especially with anti-magic up. But on something like the the idol of sorcery it's also healing your hit points and your stamina so it's a really hard to get rid of right like it's not like it's going to wipe your army fast but it's like how do you kill this like basically monolith that's getting a hundred health per turn from sultry yeah that's something that i, I like i literally ran that on jotunheim specifically to drop the idol and cast that spell right so i i really think this build is cool like it's a it's a scale build, like a hundred percent. It's it's really just a skill. Uh, but late game, you might get to see this drop. The soul drain isn't even really the big one. The thing that people are using idol of sorcery from now, I've I, yeah, I've seen it a few times now. Is bone grinding, and oh, sure, yeah, it is too. It, it if you have high enough death to do it, you need to be death six at least. It's it's us, sir. Fucking oppressive. It's so um, all right. It's so nuts. So, so yeah, and and basically, this is a full skills build, which right. Kenji is very very good at. Right. So again, just to kind of go back to the like kind of folks that are a little bit newer, what LA Pan is good at mm -hmm. is that it has some of the most efficient mages in the game, the Centaur Sages, which right. also have very good stats, like to the point that you can thug these guys if you want to. Right. But in practice, they're just very good mages, and use them to cast very good spells because they are s1 x1 mages where the x1 includes such wonderful things as air earth and nature right and they have water too which is you know you can also use those guys so all their mages are good all their mages are cheap all their mages have bonus at research so and they still by... get the pan which is the and know, they an still amazing, get the pan an amazing is, yeah, yeah amazing mage so they have and very the dryad, good magic. of course in some ways it's the best dryad it's the cheapest dryad of yes. all the eras, so, but it's the least so flexible. So, so Pangea in LA basically benefits from having gold as much or more than any other nation. Like right. Pangea can spend its gold extremely efficiently. Yeah, and it has great troops. So its troops are a little bit on the expensive side. Cataphracts are, as far as infantry goes, like they're on. You know, they're expensive for infantry. Like they're thirty gold, right? Yeah, thirty-five. Um, thirty-five. Yeah, thirty-five. Yeah. So they're very expensive for infantry, but they have two attacks. They have really high base hit points. Yeah. And they have two attacks per square. So as far as infantry but they're, goes, they're basically they're... cavalry, right? They just don't have the cavalry tag because they're centaurs. So, right? Centaurs are infantry. I like, I, like, I, yeah, I do okay. make this distinction. Yeah, because okay, they, that's fair. They can't, they can't defense tank. That's true. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, they're just very good heavy infantry. But they're so, fast. They have they're, they're mixed. Very, they're a hybrid, right? Because they have the yeah, speed of cavalry. They and they've got the lances like cavalry does, but they get the strength bonus on their hoof attack, which horsemen don't get. And like you right. said, they get the full, they get the full defense penalty from harassment, unlike normal cavalry. But they've got right, so they a ton of protection. Yes. So so Pangea has very expensive, and and their their crossbows are the same way. Actually, the crossbows right. cost more. But they have higher precision. Right. So they, they hit more often. And they're um, not good in melee. And like, they have high protection. But they have and high they protection. Have high protection. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they have very good troops, but very expensive troops. So kind you the, really want... The, kind of the transition that they made from like middle... Like in middle age and early age, they're a very stealthy nation. In late age, they're like, eh, we'll keep a little bit of the stealth stuff. But really, we're switching to armor. <laughs> That's... Right. And then, and then their sacreds oh, in guys. L.A. Oh no, the dried uh, hoplites. Yeah. So the dried hoplites. Uh, this is one of the things that I really like about the scales build is that you still expand with them. They're sacreds that are very good at beating province defense and indies, because ten morale units cannot do very well against awe. Okay. And these are three per square awe units with. 
okay protection. Leather protection. Four per great. square. Four per square. Right? Four per square. You're right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So uh, in melee, these are fantastic units, and they don't need much of a bless. So like I mentioned, when when I yeah. played this nation, I ran plus two defense. But if you don't run plus two defense, these are still the guys that you recruit for expansion. Yeah. I can see that. So uh, I do not I, like I the idea of putting bless points on them that much, you know. Oh yeah, you know. no. Like you don't you don't need to invest in a bless for these right. guys. You can run like a stats resist bless if you want to. You know, if the, you want to shroud here or whatever. The other but kind of practice, hilarious thing for a bless is the keeper of tradition. Because you can't do like yeah, really yeah, meme -y yeah. Minotaur thug things with them. Maryland did this, it didn't work, but yeah. No, no, actually Maryland is something to that. So someone did this thing where they took larger and like a keeper bless uh, mm -hmm. where they ended with like these guys. Yeah, they were just super behind. Like they got yeah. to a decent size, but they were just so far behind on research. It wasn't worth it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, so like with ride hoplites, with any build, like even just a full scales build, uh, you expand with these guys. And yeah, so like I mentioned, this is this isn't exactly the build that I ran because I mean, I ran even more scales. I ran order scales. Right. And it but looks like they have running... recruited dryad hoplites here with good yes. scale. So it looks like they're following. Yeah. Did, did you talk to them or is this just kind of a... This is looking at turn four and knowing how the Sination plays. Like, yeah. they are running the sort of build that I would run with Pangea. Yeah. Recruiting the sort of units that I would recruit with Pangea. Cool. I'm really excited so to see I... that play out. Yeah. So I, I think Warpsy is going to do really well. All right. Next up, we've got Marignol. And... <laughs> so so the the whole theme of Marignon it, it gets darker in the late age right in the middle age it's kind of like hey we're the cheerful inquisition in the late age it's like yeah we've been tampering with the dark arts and yeah, um, we, if you read the lore they basically summoned demons to kill the undead and then got corrupted by the demons right so it's a very cool nation. Who's playing it? We've got uh, Frenzy, who I yeah. don't know, and Holiday Dota, who I do know, is a very good player. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Oh, so this is, I know Holiday this is Dota, an but yeah, yeah. Same for same, same. Yeah, this is a, this is an awake researcher build, which is Ooh, very cool. That's very spicy. So what do they have? They've yeah. got a master enchanter here. Um. Hmm. So, so awake researcher. I, that means we don't have an incarnate bless. Wait, that means they do have an incarnate bless. Oh, they bless. do have an incarnate bless. Okay. Well, you know, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you I corrected actually... me the last time. I was like, oh, it's a researcher. And you're like, no, it's an incarnate bless. I was like, okay. <laughs> well, this, I assume this, this you are... were using researcher to mean they yeah, didn't yeah, take enough no. stuff to have a good bless. But... No, you're right. In terms of the build priority, they took this master and to be an awake researcher, right. not to be an incarnate bless. Right. Their, their bless is very, is very small. That said, they do uh, get so, so the the sacred for these guys is a big halberd carrying dude. These guys, the hands of justice. Um, um, yeah, so they're kind of yeah. I have opinions on Marignon. Okay, let's see. Um, I've got so, opinions so, too. So, in my opinion, LA Marignon as a nation is very good with an imprisoned extreme bless where you dump most of your scales. Oh God, you're not going to make flagellants, are you? You're going to make the Hands of Justice to expand, and then no. you're going to make lots of flagellants. <laughs> no. So you expand with the, the halberdiers, oh, no. and then you make these flagellants who are six attack per square. Right. Garbage, really bad <laughs> units with really bad the stats. Viewers don't listen to this. Don't do this. You're yeah, going to do so, it in a uh, game, and you're going to fail, and people are going to laugh at you when you make flagellants and die. Don't I do won 1v3 with Marignon, so okay. <laughs> If you're playing a very small game where you're playing against only four other people, you can win with Marignon running a heavy Bless build. That's that's all I'm going to say then. Yeah. Um, so I like Bless Marignon builds. And you can rush other people early, especially melee nations. Well, Jalen, so it's left... worth, worth pointing out, they are special. They do actually have two attacks. It's different. Some people kind of won't know this mechanic. If you have I two attacks... Two against shields. Yeah, and that. If you have two attacks built into the weapon like this, number of attacks two you can still only kill one unit. So that's one of the ways it's different than if you were to like have two flails, you could kill two units a turn. 
This is just going to give you a second chance at killing the first unit you target. But cool to know. And with anyway. flagellants, that's basically all you need because these are right. trash, garbage, awful units that can't kill more than one unit a turn, anyways, because right. they're bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the, one of the things about blood, though, which is something Late Age Marignan can do, is it's basically a different way to turn population into power rather than going through the gold route. And uh -huh. uh, so if you I dump through, you're... if you dump you through your scales, upon my build focus, right? Yeah, if you dump <laughs> through your scales, you're going to be leaning real hard into blood and diabolists who are really good. Yeah, I named my Marignol Pretender the Penyon Domen for obvious reasons for those that read Malazan. So, anyways, yeah, you basically turn your empire into a hellscape, right. and you kill all of your own people in order to make lots of demons and crazy sacred right. murder machines. I'll add to this, though. So they don't have the best troops in the era, but they have some pretty good options. They have pretty low resource crossbows. These are eminently spammable crossbows that are just solid. They're very solid. So you can lean into those if you do a scales version. For expansion, if you do scales expansion, the Royal Guard are really good. They're expensive in gold, but they're better because you're not really worried about the gold cost. They're I mean, also high resource cost, though. Yeah, they just... I. I mean, I've scale, tested scales expansion a lot. They tend to do, they tend to be the best I found for scales expansion. Maybe I didn't oh, yeah, test no, all I'm, not, I'm not saying that Royal Guards aren't what you want to yeah. to expand. I'm just saying that like they're also high right. resources. Yeah, yeah. It's like if you're doing that build, you need that high production. Right. Um, later in the game, when you switch out of like worrying about expansion and you care more about gold efficiency, you can get Swordsman too, which are they as good as like Zweihanders? Not really, but they're cheaper than Zweihanders that like Ulm gets, and they've got a big fucking greatsword and 17 protection. One thing they don't tend to have a lot of is shields. If you yes. look at this whole roster, they don't have it. So they're not going to do great against crossbows, but you can probably make more crossbows than any of your neighbors if you really want to. And you've got fire and air magic, so you can do flaming arrows and wind guide and arrow fend. So, yeah, and one of the things about their crossbows, which I, I actually think is a big deal, is their crossbows have 11 base morale. Indie crossbows have 9 base morale. Oh, that's a good so, point. So that's going to yeah, matter so a lot in crossbow duels, right? Because they'll be more likely to run. Will, yeah. Yeah. So if, if you're playing Marignon in the not crazy way that I enjoy of like spamming at your sacreds, if you're just doing like the more sane crossbow spam style of Marignon, that's your bread and butter. Right. You, you spam these crossbows. And you beat the other dude's crossbows because your crossbows don't run away as fast. And they've got, you know, 10 gold for nine protection. Right. 10 resources. Like, they're, they're pretty good crossbow dudes. They're pretty good crossbow dudes. Thing is, they don't and, really mix. They don't really play well together with your other troops. Like, if you have 400 crossbows and you're like, oh, I'll have a front line of pick your unit here. They're going to fuck up your own front line. <laughs> like, yeah, the way you play Marignan with a crossbow focus, like, scales filled is you literally just by crossbows right. and separate out smaller squads of your crossbows to tank. Right. Um, this guy or the, this bill ran inspiration oh. for their bless, which is spicy. I like and it. Very, very much a crossbow focus build. This, yeah. is, this is the crossbow Marignon, not the crazy murder right. everyone that you control to spam out Blyzelin's Marignon. But this build. isn't full scales. What, oh, we've got a researcher. So this is an awake researcher you know what I think this is? I think this is Rush Flaming Arrows, Wind Guide, Aerofend, and have a fuck ton of crossbows. I think so, too. Well, yeah, so I think that or Air Elementals. That's the other yeah, thing they can do. That's true. So I'm, I'm genuinely... They can also do the mists, like Freezing Mist and stuff, I think, or some of them. They uh, might have freezing to be Mist and Sulfur Hazes. Yeah, yeah, they can do Freezing Mist and Sulfur Haze. Right. Um, which is very cool. So uh, this is one of the nations where I don't know exactly what they're going to be doing, but because I know that at least one of the players on this team is actually really good, I think there's yeah. a lot of potential here. So this is one of the ones where I'm just really excited to see what they're going to run, like what's their first research goal they're going to hit and whether they're going to start deploying. Because I think that there is some variety right. of options they can do. They can do elementals. They can do evocation. They can do just buffs for their crossbows. I, I don't want to uh, sidetrack you too much here, Sai, but... Do you know what that yeah. crossbow build is not going to be very good for? Beating darkness units? Controlling the lake near their capital. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, yeah, no. I don't know why they I wanted don't know that why lake. They did it. That lake is bad for them. That lake is for a me. fucking curse. 
The only thing that I can think of is if they wanted to do construction early yeah. and then go put like a like a weak aquatic units underwater. I mean, they could go sail onto a Gartha or something, right? And just go try to wreck them at you know for a first war. But oh, I don't I have no idea what they're gonna do to control That's this. A bad first war though. Did we talk about the Gartha? We haven't. There are I think our last one. Let's move on to Agartha. Okay. So Agartha. All right. Uh, did we? I think I got a message from Agartha. Let's start with that because I've been really bad about messages this turn. We'll do better, I promise. Hi, I hope everyone has a good, fun game. Aquarium is a fantastic. I don't know what this is. I, ha I haven't told Aaron I'm sending this. So this is Aaron's partner, Dark Wolf. Oh, uh, okay. So that's interesting. So so Aaron and Dark Wolf are very different players in terms of their play style. Yeah, Aaron wasn't going to have a Hydra partner, and then he just, like, kind of asked, and Dark Wolf Aaron volunteered. Aaron have Hydra partner in terms of the Florida men. Okay. His partners are Elite Zion and Nick Knight. Okay. No, but they didn't, they they didn't agree to Hydra partner this, though. They're, they're all Hydra partners in whatever games they're playing, if they're not in the game. Like, okay. like you, Aaron's going to show his turns to Nick Knight. You, like, okay. that's just the thing. It's going to happen. Okay. They're the, they're the Florida men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a team. Okay, yeah, so so Aaron is a very interesting dude. He is a hard Diplo player. Yeah. He's a player that will, like... he. I, I've been honest. very annoyed playing with him from his diplomacy. He just He's just, like, a very smug, cocksure Diplo player. Like, he's like... You know how some players are, like, cocksure of their, like, their ability to play the game? He's just, like, cocksure yeah. of his diplomacy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's like, okay, I mean, that's... Be like, oh, we've got a coalition against you, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. It's like, oh my god, you fucker. Or not even a coalition, like dogpile or something. Yes. Anyway, but yeah, he's a, you're right. This is the diplomancer. Yeah. So the interesting thing here to me is that he picked Agartha, which right. is, in my opinion, on the lowest tier of LA nations. Like they're not as bad as City, but right. they're not a good nation. And then the other thing about this nation now, you is have, that... Just to, to plug your channel, you have a Late Age Agartha series back from Dominions 3 or 4. It was 4. It was 4. I had, okay. I had, I had Dominions 3. That, okay. So, okay. So I have one with Agartha and Dominions 4. Right. But... That was a different blessed um, system. You went... I yes. still remember it. You went Nature 9, Earth 9. Yes. I was actually going to say, like, Agartha actually got heavily nerfed in the blessed transition because those were the two blesses that were best on Agartha's sacreds. And both of those were nerfed in the right. switchover. Because if you, you, you basically can't get the natural protection plus the reinvigoration from Earth. Right. Like the Earth 9 thing was the best thing for Gartha. And Nature 9, like if you want to lean more into two oracles, like that's what you would do. Right. Because um, it was back in the minions four, you got bonus hit points from taking regen, regen. So these guys became like, yeah. I mean, the blind fight. Yeah. Did you use, you use blind fighters? Yes. Yeah. So basically the bless that or the two blesses that were best for Agartha were both nerfed yeah. in the transition. Right. So the the new Dominions 5 Agartha still has some of the stuff that was good in Dominions 4 Agartha. Like they have very good elemental magic options. Right. And they actually have these pretty good sacreds. So two Morgals are great for claiming thrones. Right. So Pulgals are actually still surprisingly good combat units just based on their like high stats and high size. But he is not running a bless. Oh. If he is running a bless, it's an imprisoned incarnate bless. Yeah, because this is his full bless, of scales. His bless, if you actually look at his bless, is morale plus one, which means he has literally zero bless points. I, I approve of that actually. Incarnate. So let's let me or add, let me incarnate. add to the flavor of, of Agartha. So I've played this. Is how I got disqualified from the from the first very first tournament was I played Agartha and died. I did some weird kind of meme the blind fighter aura build cave knights are great for expanding they're very gold inefficient but they're very efficient for expansion they're great at expanding one of the notable things about agartha is they have the agarthan steel crossbow which is inferior in damage to the middle-aged dome crossbow the arbalist but that only fires every three rounds aside from that it's the highest damage crossbow in the game and so agartha as a scales nation, it's still very playable. Right. It has non-sacred E1, D2 mages, which increase resources. Right. So you can spam out those crossbows, as you were saying. Yeah. So you get crossbows plus scales spam. 
And then you also have a fire mages, so you can do both flaming arrows and fire elementals, right. both to counter certain enemy magics and for frontline. But here's the problem that Scales of Arthur runs into. It's not good against the strongest mid-game magics, namely Foul Vapors or Wailing Winds or Air Elementals. So any of the things that are strongest in the, in the mid-game, like when you first hit those like battlefield-defining spells, yeah. Agartha doesn't have great counters to those. Right. And in the late game, Agartha does not have an economic bonus. So it doesn't have blood and it doesn't have uh, gem bonuses the way that Erythia does. Right. Yeah, it, it does. It doesn't have obvious things it wants to do in the late game. And the crossbows do get hard. You know, while these are some of the best crossbows in the game, like all other archery, once Storm and Aerofin and Army of Gold comes out, they don't matter. Right. And Agartha also gets hard countered in a first war scenario by Titans. So Agartha needs yep. to have actually specific, like, build counters to a huge variety of things because they can't beat early game army clear. They can't beat early anti-game army build considerations, namely, you know, Titan stuff. Yeah. And they, they don't have an answer to decent battlefield clear in general, namely right. Battle Papers and Whaley Wins. So they actually lose every strong early mid-game magic-based push. I, and they don't have strong secrets. Yeah, I'll add so a, a couple caveats there. So I lost, actually, because I couldn't deal with this Earth Serpent way back when, which is, you know, kind of Titan tier level of... Uh, Earth Serpent, oh, embarrassing. Okay. No, but it was it was a Joe Minis Earth Serpent. He had fluffed it with Aerofin, because that's something only Joe Min can do. Right, because they have that point buff arrow fin thing. Embarrassing. Okay. So, you know, so he point buffs that. He had like double region. It was a bunch of shit and on it. And you couldn't build construction to items because it was very hard to click on. Yeah. Well, it, 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 anyway, it. there's things I learned about, but no, but it's to your point, right? Like you have to have for like really hard targets that are going to be immune to crossbows, like a Titan can be, you don't. You might only get one opportunity in the game to be ready for it. And if you're not ready for it in time, then your army's gone, right? So these are things you have to think about really hard with Agartha because they kind of can be hard. Like they don't have big two-handed swords you're buffing with strength of giants like other nations have, which are maybe going to give Titans a harder time or something, right? They have crossbows. You put on an Aerofin amulet and you're now taking, you know, one-fifth the damage. And that's it, you know, and then other buffs get added after that. So anyway, it's, I think you're, there's, oh, the other thing is for things like Foul Vapors, 400 crossbows, the tens, it can be pretty okay at making Foul Vapors things go away pretty quickly. Like compared to heavy infantry, which have to like trudge through like across long, slow walks across terrain to like close, like Atlantis is going to have. You yeah. can make a Foul Vapors caster immune to your crossbows, no problem. Yeah, that that's possible too. So can bite you. Right. But you're going to start shooting crossbows pretty quickly is kind of my point. So if... Yeah. And, and, and naked Satif Hell Vapors caster isn't going to kill an entire with an army by itself. No, but, but I mean, even an army of like a hundred dudes back, you know, that are immune to foul vapors backed up by a foul vapors caster. Crossbow fights tend to not last as long as heavy infantry fights is more my point. You know, so you I have suppose. a chance to like route the army and then it'd be over. I still think the Pythium can absolutely wipe an Agarthan army with like three guys. Okay. Maybe. I mean, we have to see. Yeah. But I mean, 300 crossbows is a lot of damage too. But I'm not, I mean, you can tank 300 crossbows. So yeah. Uh, no, you stack three guys, one of whom is a foul vapors caster, and the other two of whom are layering buffs. Everyone stacked with equipment. Like that's a, that's an army kill. Like yeah, it could set be. up with. Could be. Yeah. Zero. yeah, could like, be. You, Pythium can make an Agarthan killing thug squad like turn 11. Okay. So anyway, but yeah, these are the kind of things that Agartha has some things they're good at. The other thing that we I didn't mention is that they're kind of like the, the nation where we're going to shoot you. And, you know, normally you're worried about blowing up your own front line with crossbows, which is annoying. They're like, yeah, our front line is skeletons that we're summoning. So it's a kind of cool thing. Like, we're going to shoot crossbows at you and summon skeletons to keep you tied up oh, in combat. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, Agartha is really... Okay, so like, if you're they fighting have... someone else who is just dumping troops at you... Right. Agartha will beat them. No problem. Like, in yeah. a troopy troop fight, Agartha is really good. 
even in like a troop be sacred fight, like you yeah. know, uh, my sacred's at plus six defense, plus eight attack, plus eight strength, yeah. like, whatever. Yeah. Here's, doesn't care. here's a thousand skeletons and uh, you know a thousand crossbow bolts. Yeah, yeah. Agartha can take those types of like right. stat check. It's no problem. It's just that Agartha gets countered. Right. They're not very Matt. flexible. They have like some real holes in the national roster that makes it really hard to deal with some stuff. You know. Yeah. So so based on Agartha's build. I suspect that they haven't hit a hidden incarnate bless, but they're mostly skills. You can take, like, if you have a, an imprisoned, like, immobile, you can usually get, like, one very, one small incarnate with this. Or you could get, yeah. like, because if you go full, like, if you go immobile and you don't take really anything, you're only, like, maybe two, three, you, that will actually buy you for most nations perfect scales. So yeah. they might it's have, fun thinking, they could have taken because, like recuperation and maybe yeah, they're doing Yeah, their four also perfect. I'm actually thinking N7. It might be recuperation. It's either yeah. that or regen. Right. But they're an imprisoned incarnate bless, right. I think. So, I and I have no idea which one it is, but, you know, it's probably, but, yeah. I mean, regardless yeah. of their build, they are doing a, a Diplo build where they don't like get into a war where they don't pick who they're fighting. That's, that's what they're, <laughs> that's what they're going to do. Yeah, let's see. Let's see how that works. Okay, so we finally made it, Side. We finished this one. Well done. Only three hours. Only three hours. What are closing thoughts? What do you think? I'm really excited to watch this game. Like I, I like I meant, I, I, as I mentioned as we went, like I do have, definitely have very strong opinions on some of these builds. And I think some people are going to do better than others based on what they're running. But I think this is going to be a really good game. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do too. I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. I think... You know, some of the things I have opinions on too, but, you know, the other thing that I think to, that I keep in mind is that everybody in this game has had different paths to get here. People played in different communities on different servers and different metas. They've all been in different games. They've learned different lessons. And we, now we just get to see how they all interact. And it was hard for everybody to get here. You have to win a 12 player game where everybody in that game has won a game before, you know? So I'm expecting a, a really, really good game to unfold here. So looking forward to it. And looking forward to casting it with you, Sai. So thanks so much for, for signing up with this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for letting me cast. Cool. So uh, viewers, next time we'll actually have real turns and real battles. Until then, take care.